ESPN 94.1 FM at AM 930. Present The Drive. It is Monday, February 5th. Your drive begins now on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. We're going to get your text in this hour, 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. As we've got Marshall basketball to recap from the weekend, had a chance to catch up with both Kim Caldwell earlier today and Dan D'Antoni. We'll get a couple of their thoughts on the games on Saturday. So the good news is the Marshall men won, beating Coastal Carolina 91-74. to On the flip side, not the outcome we were expecting for the Marshall women. It had to end eventually, right? The the perfect streak in conference play upset. James Madison got the win, 72-63. Good crowd on hand for the women, 2,526 were in attendance part of that double header on Saturday. And then the announced crowd for the men, it was a sellout. 5,711 came to see the herd take on Coastal Carolina. And I think the fans went home happy. As far as the men were concerned, we got to see a better shooting performance from the Thundering Herd. Shot over 50% in the game. Almost 38% from the three-point line. Free throws still. Got to work on that a little bit. Those are free throws. But 68.4% there. And the Herd gets the victory. Stays within striking distance of the leaders in the top spots for that number one overall seed in the conference tournament or at least trying to play for that regular season championship. Ultimately, it only matters where you end up after the tournament. And if you're the champion, that's what Dan D'Antoni's squad's looking for. So we'll get into a lot of that with you. And as I mentioned, we're going to hear from you. Text line this hour, 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. That is our number to be a part of today's edition of the show here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. So did you do the doubleheader? I think that's the big question right now is, did you do the doubleheader and do you want to see that again? Would you like to see more of the men and women playing on the same day? Of course, the women, they've got a Wednesday game coming up. It's going to be the education day, so there's going to be about 2,000 screaming kids. So if you had a chance to go to any Marshall basketball game, that's one you should go because the kids always get into it. It's going to be loud. It's going to be screaming and hollering nonstop until those kids have to leave. You know, most get to stay for the duration of the game, but afterwards it's uh, it's never going to be the same again. It just can't because those kids bring such an energy to the Henderson Center. It's always fun. So if you've got a moment, if you can actually go to that one, that's a fun one to go to. And, of course, the men are going to be on the road on Wednesday, off on Saturday. They're not part of the Sunbelt MAC Challenge, which I think is a good decision on the administration's part not to be a part of that, only because – Marshall already sees MAC schools yearly basis. Marshall schedules MAC schools that make sense to Marshall. Always a good game when it's Marshall and Ohio. You want to see that. Toledo, I'm fine with that. You can always play Toledo. You can always play Akron. I'm, I'm okay with some of those schools. You know, the Red Hawks, I like to see more of the Red Hawks. Some of those games make sense. Some of them don't, but... For Marshall, I don't know if a random matchup is going to work, especially when you play several teams, usually on a yearly basis when it comes to the league you were formerly in. Of course, you've got Conference USA in between stints in the Mid-American Conference in this current run and the Sun Belt. I don't know if I want to see a lot of Conference USA schools. I mean, a lot of them are American schools now, but there's not a lot of them I want to see again. Certain ones in the Mid-American Conference, I think, make perfect sense. Ohio always needs to be on the schedule. You should have a contest with the Bobcats yearly. I know you can't play two. One's fine. You can alternate that game. Totally fine. But that was a good decision not to be in the MAC Sunbelt Challenge. And you're trying to improve the quality of basketball in the Sunbelt. 
I just don't think Marshall needs to be a part of that one. And so, thankfully, Marshall's not. That means Marshall gets a Saturday off. You go on the road, then you get a Saturday. And technically, it's a Saturday off. Kim Caldwell talked a little bit earlier today about how this is going to be an opportunity for her squad to be able to retool a little bit. They're going to go through their same rhythm. They're not just going to take the Saturday off and hang out at the mall, go have a nice little dinner or something, you know, watch pre-Super Bowl coverage, anything like that. They're going to go through their normal rhythm, and they're going to try to install some things maybe a little differently. That was something that when I talked to Kim earlier today, I asked her, you know, do you have an opportunity? Can you throw in a new wrinkle here or there? And she's like having an open day like Saturday kind of gives us an opportunity to do that. So we'll hear from them, get their comments a little bit later on in the program. But I want to hear from you. And again, that number is 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. That's the number to be a part of our show daily here on ESPN 94.1. And AM 9:30. As I alluded to, Super Bowl week is here. We've got the game for you. We'll have West One. We'll have Westwood One's coverage of Super Bowl 58 right here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 9:30. Who do you have in this one? The Chiefs, or do you have the 49ers? Who do you like in this one? I can't root for the 49ers, so I have to take the Chiefs. And I know. The Chiefs have beaten the Bengals before, and a lot of people don't like Taylor Swift. I don't know why. I don't get it. What the problem here is? So you're seeing a lot of you're seeing a lot of Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. They're the it couple right now, at least in a lot of circles, and so that's annoyed a lot of sports fans. Again, it's it's fine. It's totally fine. There are probably a lot of people who are tuning in now for a Super Bowl that normally wouldn't tune in for a Super Bowl just because of it, and I'm okay with it. But we've got the game for you, and I'm looking forward to it. It's coming up on Sunday, and we'll have that game and all the pregame coverage beginning at 2 o'clock. So right after you're done doing what you need to do on a Sunday morning, mid-morning, afternoon, if you have to be away from the TV, that's fine. We got you covered starting at 2. You can listen to that coverage here again on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. So we'll hear from Dan D'Antoni in a few minutes about the win. We'll break it down. Then we'll hear a little bit from Kim Caldwell about the loss. We'll break it down, and we'll hear from you. What do you think? You think Marshall is able to bounce back? They got three or four. The homestand, three out of four, that's not bad. Now they got an opportunity to go on the road, and they'll take on Troy. They need to get that one. Dan actually said it. They need to get that one. That's important. I know the other day he said there, he doesn't believe in the, you know, you, you must win game, but he does understand the importance of, okay, I'm not going to live like, all right, if I didn't win this one, it's it's over. But he knows that this is an important game. Marshall has to have this game. Marshall needs to start winning and winning out to have a legitimate shot at the top spot in the league standings. You want to win a regular season championship, you got to continue on. Three out of four is not bad at home. Hopefully you don't have another lull like you did a couple of nights ago. Can the women maintain their momentum after a loss? It's easy to talk about herd basketball when you're winning, but now the herd... Losing the first game in conference, what's the response going to be like? I'm curious about all of that, and we'll discuss it with you. 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. More coming up on this edition of The Drive on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. This is The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to our Monday edition of The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. Our text line this hour is 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. Let's go to the text line first. Texture says, or asks, do you know why the herd stopped playing Moorhead State? I wish it would continue. 
appreciate that from the text line. That's a good question because right now, Moorhead State's net, if I'm reading this right, if I got the right info here, they have a net right now of 101. That's not bad. That's not bad. They have an 0-2 record in quad one. They have a 0-2 record in quad two. Their quad three record is 2-0, and and their quad four record is 12-0. and So they've beat all the teams they should in quadrant four. They've been okay in quadrant three. Could do a little bit better in quadrant one and quadrant two. Those losses were Alabama and Purdue in quad one. and quad two, they lost Penn State and they lost to Indiana. So they've still got some games left, all of them, you know, looking like quad four games. I don't know if you're going to get, you know, all of the value that you want. And that's part of it. That's why Marshall was in that event earlier in the season, try to play some higher level teams. That's why Marshall's at Kentucky this year. Part of that's obviously money. But part of that's also you're going to play a higher level team and you're going to get credit for that. I think that's part of a larger rescheduling, trying to put together a more competitive schedule for the Thundering Herd because you're trying to get into an at-large situation here. If you don't win the regular season tournament, you're trying to get into an at-large situation because Marshall did not get a look serious look at the NIT. So Marshall fell short. Marshall wasn't going to get an at-large into the NCAA tournament. And so the NIT, a lot of people hoped, a lot of fans wanted that to happen. Didn't happen, so Marshall made the decision, look, we're not going to play in these pay-for-play tournaments. And I still think that's the proper stance. And I know there's an argument for playing in those games. I've been told that it's a reward for the fans. Well, do you think that's a reward to play in a tournament like this? A tournament which you have to pay to play or, you know, you're basically buying home games if you do it right. That's what you're doing. You're buying home games. And I just don't think it matters that much, the grand scheme of things. I don't know how many fans are going to turn out. The reason why you play in the CIT, you know, you were trying to get John Elmore a record. And then you won, and you might as well just go out and win the thing. If you're in it, you go to win it. But you brought that tournament to Huntington for a reason. You wanted to make sure that John Elmore got the scoring record, which he did. And then Tavion Kinsey comes and breaks it. But you still at the time wanted John to have that opportunity to get that record. He was close. And so the CIT allowed you to have more playing time for John Elmore and for the team. And you get a chance to go out there play the tournament, win it, you go home happy at the end of the day. I just don't know if that's going to be the new reality here, if that is worth enough of an effort to bring a tournament like that back to the Henderson Center, basically, because you you want to buy the games. If you're Marshall, you don't want to to go on the road in a tournament like that, do you? I don't think you do. You see some of the teams that are in that tournament, and hey – I used to be an okay fan of those, kind of proponent. Yeah, sure, it's another opportunity to play basketball. But NCAA tournament, I think, is the ultimate goal, always the ultimate goal. Get into the tournament, have some success in the tournament. You know, maybe you get lucky. Maybe you can make it to the Elite Eight. Who knows? Maybe you can make it to the Sweet 16. Have some consistency in getting into the NCAA tournament, build your program that way. That's one way. Okay, you don't get into the tournament. How do you get better? Well, maybe you play in the NIT, still a quality tournament. You do that, and maybe you get enough going. Maybe you can start working your way into the NCAA tournament. You win, have some success. Maybe you go out and you win the NIT. I know when Dan played in the NIT, it was the bigger deal. The NIT used to be the bigger deal. And it's still, I think, a reputable, respectable tournament. I know the jokes for over the years were that nobody was interested, the not interested tournament, but I think the NIT is fine. It's not my ultimate goal, but it's fine. For Marshall, I think, honestly, if you're trying to improve your resume and have success, you need to have some higher-level opponents, and that probably is the reason why we might not see Moorhead as much. Now, 
Marshall could flip the script on me tomorrow and Moorhead could be coming right back up here in the Henderson Center. But I think scheduling's got a lot to do with it. But I get it. It's a resource for you if you're a basketball team that have a school close by. You can bring them in, bring some fans in. You can go on the road. You can take some fans. Travel's not going to be that costly. I like the game. I would work my schedule elsewhere. I would like to see Ohio on the schedule. I would like to see Moorhead State on the schedule. Always want to see schools like that that Marshall has a history with. Moorhead plays some okay basketball. They're not bad at all. But those are two definite schools. Am I missing any school? Is there a must-have school that Marshall should just play every year? Doesn't matter what league it's in. Ohio for me, Moorhead State – Western Kentucky, maybe? Do you get Western Kentucky back on the schedule? I'm sure I'm missing someone. I'm missing some missed opportunity here to try to get back on the basketball schedule. Texter writes in. This was, uh, according to a texter, texter said that on Colin Cowherd, Caleb Williams camp was speaking on whether Colin wanted to play for the Bears, and their comment, they said, we don't want to go to a city that doesn't care. We don't want to go to some sunbelt place where you tarp off the upper deck. And they want to hear my comments about tarping off the upper deck. And um, do I think that Marshall's tarping sections make others think we and other sunbelt schools don't care? I think you're going to see across the college landscape, you're going to see schools eventually right size. I think when Marshall opened up now Joan C. Edwards Stadium, it was right sized. The theory was if you add seating, you can attract bigger schools. The theory here is if you had more seating, you could possibly make a push to get into a bigger conference. I know there were talks about the Big East many years ago and other leagues, but ultimately I think it should be thought of as a better experience instead of more fans. You want fans, you want to have as many fans that you can get into the stadium, but at the same time, there comes a point where you want to work on fan quality, fan experience. I'm okay with the end zones being tarped off because they're not going to be used much longer. Eventually, that's going to go away. And then somebody's going to have to be reseated that would have those seats. So you take that process, take it now, deal with it now. Anyone that had seats up there, and it wasn't that many that had season tickets, and we're not talking about you know, game day tickets or season tickets or only what I'm talking about here, not single game tickets. But if you move those fans now, later you can open that end zone up for whatever project you want to have. You've got the newer scoreboard now. You can have a end zone suite. You can have party deck. You can have more options there. And – I didn't think Marshall needed the capacity. Marshall has a good, strong core fan base, but it's been a long time since Marshall has sold out the stadium. Year in and year out, there are going to be some games that can't come close. There are going to be some games that are totally no one's interested in. But I think the stadium needs to be right-sized, and I think there are some other issues, honestly. I don't think it's a lack of we just don't care. I think is let's have the stadium fit what we have as far as a fan base and just create a little demand as well. Instead of, okay, I'm not going to buy a season ticket because I can just walk up on game day and, you know, they never sell out, so I can just walk up on game day, get a ticket. I'm good. That's, that's good for you and me. I don't have to get a season ticket. I'll just show up. I'll get a ticket in the end zone. I'm good. Well, now you can't do that as easily. 
It's because they're trying to create demand for the tickets that they do have available. At the same time, there's going to be some different projects that are going to open up when you get rid of that excess seating in the end zone. I think it's a, I think it's a stupid statement. Just because you tarp some seats off doesn't mean you don't care. It's we got a in Marshall's case, we've got a project that's eventually coming. Seriously, it's a project that is going to be a long-term project. You had to get rid of some seats because you're going to expand the scoreboard. Okay, now you've done that. Now you're eventually going to have to get rid of some seats because you want to do something else in that area, and that can be anything from just a party deck. Or you can have some luxury suites there. You can have some different type of seating there and create a new value and create a new opportunity for money because these are going to be pricier seats and there's going to be nicer seats. Same thing with the Henderson Center. You can tarp those off and create more of a demand. And I honestly would like to see Eventually, those seats go away. If I really had the ability, I would like to see the Henderson Center gutted and start again and reconfigure those seats in more of a a circular, rounded-out manner, the best I could with the space I have. And I would create some maybe some, some luxury suites in those upper levels, not just the overhang you have now in the Henderson Center. I would create something a little bit different up there. I would have maybe... Yeah, a few luxury suites, a few boxes, have some box seating up there, and you still have your seating in the lower bowl. There are things you can do. All of this takes money. All of this takes time. You got to have that first. But in Marshall's case, at least, and I'm not trying to defend Marshall or, or I'm not trying to carry Marshall's water, but I know the seating In football's case, you're going to do something different with those end zone seats. In basketball's case, okay, we're going to try to create some demand here for these tickets. And let's be honest, the seats up there are terrible. In the Henderson Center, they've always been terrible. Long before Christian Spears got here, long before Mike Hamrick got here, long before K.O. Markham got here, long before Lance West was the athletic director, long before any of those administrations— Those seats were terrible. There's no railings up there. It's a horrible seat. I'm glad it's gone. If you're going to reseat the Henderson Center, do it right when you can. Cut those seats off. They're terrible. Back to our text line. Texter says, there's no excuse for why we cannot clearly hear the reporter's question. Is it not expensive to fix that? Okay, are we talking about... And this is uh, me responding to the texture here. Are we talking about the post game on the YouTube video? Or are we talking about the post game on our broadcast? What are we talking about here? Because here's what happens. Marshall has a microphone for Dan, for Kim, for the players. The microphone set at the table. And there's not, at this moment, a microphone that goes out into the crowd. Now, if you're talking about football, football, there's a microphone that goes into the crowd of reporters during pregame or, you know, weekly press conferences. So... It's something that I'm sure that the university's media department would love to work on to make these experiences better. I think we got to take baby steps here. But if you're talking about our broadcast, we're putting one microphone up there because we're trying to get what Dan has to say. And then we're trying to get it back to you as fast as we can. If you're talking about the university, that's a different situation, different setup. But if you're talking about our situation, like today, I've got some Dan D'Antoni comments. You're just going to hear me talk about what the questions are because I've had, had time to go in and edit them. So, you know, I think you can fix that. It's easy. Eventually, you know, you're going to have to put a little bit of effort into changing how these things are done. 
and that's not to say there's not an effort put into it now. It's just, you know, right now Dan shows up for a uh, meeting, presser like he did today. We're recording it. And then Marshall's putting it out courtesy on YouTube. I think that would be more of a Marshall question. But if you're talking about our stuff, you know, that's I've got one microphone. Sometimes I'm not miking it. Sometimes I am. That's probably more information and probably not the right information if you're asking. Okay. Texter wants to know about the Dayton Flyers. That's not ambitious. Uh, that's not too ambitious. I like that. I like that. Uh, Texter asks, it, was that a record on Saturday for the attendance of the women's game? No, that's uh, not a record. Uh, the CAM has had larger for women's basketball. Those are usually been jam the CAM events. But, you know, the attendance is getting higher. And I don't think you're going to have – the old record broken because the seating capacity is down from where it used to be. And Marshall has been over the 7,000 mark. This is just top of my head, so I don't have that exact number in front of me. But over 7,000, I believe, is the record for the Cam Henderson Center for a women's game. That's not going to be broken with the new seat configuration. Some good stuff from the text line. We appreciate that. You can join in 304-396-TALK, 304-396-TALK, 304-396-TALK. More coming up on today's edition of The Drive on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. This is The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. Marshall with the win over Coastal Carolina Saturday, 91-74. to Good crowd on hand. A lot of people stayed for the second game. A lot of people showed up for the second game. The doubleheader of the women earlier in the day, 2,526. Felt like a good crowd. The men, 5,711, the official attendance for that contest. Kevon Boyles had 26 points. Good effort from him, 10 of 18 from the field. And how about Obina and Achille Killen? He had a double-double, 10 rebounds, and had a career high of 30 points, 9 of 17 in that contest. As I alluded to earlier, Marshall shot well over 50%. Almost 38% from the three-point line. Marshall should have put them away. They only outscored Coastal Carolina by one in the second half, 43-42. Marshall had the lead for 39 minutes and 27 seconds. Marshall led by 27 in the second with 16.58 to go. So Marshall had a bigger lead. Marshall, however, pretty much it was a it was an even match in the second. And here's the interesting thing, and the specialty points, I usually look at this as an indicator, and Marshall got beat on almost every category. Points in the paint, 40-28 in favor of Coastal Carolina. 14-10 in favor of Coastal Carolina as far as points off turnovers. Marshall had 10 turnovers. Coastal only had eight. So Coastal got 14 points off of 10 Marshall turnovers. Second chance points push, 8-7 there for Coastal. Fast break points push, 9-6 in favor of Coastal. Bench points, 24 points for the Thundering Herd off the bench. Got to see almost, I think we got to see everyone, didn't we? It looks like, looking at the stat sheet, I think we got to see everyone on the floor for at least a minute. Dan D'Antoni earlier today had a chance to be a part of his weekly presser. You're not going to hear the question, but you're going to hear me ask. uh, Well, at least you're going to hear me tell you what was asked. And this is Dan, first of all, just talking about the win against Coastal on Saturday. It was a good ball game. I thought we did a a lot of good things. We needed it after kind of booting that Thursday one because we should have won that one too, although they played well. Don't want to take anything away, away from them, but... We can't score five points in the last uh, 
five and a half minutes of a game and miss five or six free throws at that time. So coming back here and winning, but still we got work to do because we were up, I think, uh, 19 at half, I believe, end up winning two points second half. We got to learn to play when you're ahead, and that is you just keep grinding it out and you don't. You don't let you, – you beat them every time, every half, every second, every possession. And uh, we're still working at that. And hopefully uh, I think these young men will, you know, they're getting better. So they keep pushing through and understand that uh, winning is every play, every possession, every ball movement, every shot. Once they know that, then uh, we have a championship type of team because we can play with anybody. So uh, hopefully that, that's going to occur. Dan also spent a lot of the time today during the presser. He was asked a question about his style of play. It was from a reporter that usually isn't there. And so Dan gave us a mini Danalytics speech. We're not going to go into that. If you want to hear that in, in its entirety, this is not the place for it today. But Dan did talk a little bit about how the team plays, how it needs to respond when it's not hitting shots because – this is a team that's set up for three things. Primarily, Marshall's looking for the three-point shot, layups, free throws. Wants to do well hitting threes, wants to hit those layup shots, wants to be able to hit shots from the free throw line. And if you're not going to be hitting good shots, you got to be a defensive team and doesn't matter how good you are in defense. If you're not making shots, you could have the best defense in basketball. You know, you're not going to have much success. So Dan talked a little bit about that when he was asked about how the team needs to play when it's not at times making shots. Well, when you're not making shots, then it gets tough. You know, I, you know, this is a basketball, and not that you can't sometimes, but if you rely on not making shots and having a good uh, record at the end of the year, you're in trouble. And I don't care who it is. Uh, and there's not a defense alive that's that good. But uh, uh, usually, you know, everybody talks about great defenses, and it's usually a slow-down offense that makes great defense. We don't play that way. So we have to make shots. That's, that's the way we play. It's a lot more entertaining. You get more people in the stands, and it's fun to watch. But, and you can win either way. You know, there's not one way to skin a cat. You can win it either way. Uh, but you have to make shots. Uh, that's, this game has evolved to where there's so much talent, and these young men have stayed in the gym a lot more than we used to. And They work at it. It's almost a craft to them. It was a recreation for us, and uh, it's a craft for them. And uh, they, uh, they understand you have to make shots because the other team will if you don't. Hurd's got to take it on the road, take it on Troy on Wednesday, 6 o'clock airtime here on 93.7 The Dog and ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. Let's talk women's basketball when we continue. We'll take more of your text at 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. More coming up on today's edition of The Drive, ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. This is The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Text line still is open, 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. Welcome back to today's edition of The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. Thundering Herd men get the victory on Saturday over Coastal Carolina. Not the same story for the women. Marshall falling for the first time in league play. Great crowd, 2,526 showed up to see the Herd in the first part of the doubleheader. But James Madison a little too tough for the Thundering Herd that day. Marshall falls 63-72. to Had a chance to catch up with Kim Caldwell earlier today during her presser. And one of the things that I asked her was as far as the bounce back is concerned. Now that we've got a situation here where you've gone through this incredible run in league play and you suffer your first loss. Now, of course, it's like any loss. 
you lose, you try to bounce back. But Marshall had been so successful for so long to start off league play. What's that bounce back process going to look like for the women now that they've suffered their first conference loss? No, I think we just got to come back with a sense of urgency. Um, we've talked about a lot of things that have needed to be fixed um, and they haven't been getting fixed. So we haven't watched the film. We're getting ready to go do that as a team. Um, but maybe now there's a sense of urgency that it costs us the game um, and they'll take us a little bit more seriously of these things need to be fixed. I have no doubt that they'll respond and they'll lock back in and they'll play hard um, and they'll do everything they can today at practice and tomorrow at practice to get it fixed for Wednesday. Kimmel's also asked if this is something that you don't want to lose, but when you do lose, is this something that coach – she's able to teach from can she coach from a loss we weren't going to win every game we knew we weren't going to make it through this uh, conference undefeated um and so when you look at the big picture if we play jmu again that's going to be the best loss that ever happened to us and so there's not a crystal ball you can't predict the future but um sometimes you need that and it's hard to beat a team three times and they're definitely a top team in the league and if we can learn from it and we can respond from it and I know that I have definitely identified some things that need to be fixed immediately then I mean failure is just an opportunity for growth so you don't want to lose obviously no coach wants to lose but she feels like okay we've lost there are some things that they did not do right I've been trying to tell them now they've lost they're going to listen to me now, and I've got things that I'm going to point out. She's really good at showing them what they need to do, what they are failing at, what they're doing well. She's, in my estimation, been a good teaching coach. Here's what you're not doing. Here's what I need you to do, and here's the film. I can show it to you. She even talked about going back and looking at the film, show them highlights of – Here's what you were doing right early on. Here's what you're doing now. And she talked a little bit about this team trying to regain some intensity. That was a question that was asked of her. You know, do you feel like, you know, you lost some inten- intensity? Do you feel like that you're going to have to do something to help them stay at that level for the rest of the season? I hope so. I think we lost it a little bit. Um, and one of the things we have today are – clips from earlier in the year and clips from our last game and how the sense of urgency and how different um, we look um, in those games. And so we kind of need to get back to how we were before. And part of it's human nature. We weren't hitting shots, so we didn't really play with the pep in our step. And we got to find ways to do that, too. That's Kim Caldwell. I'm very impressed with her. I know it's season one. And, of course, when you get off to a hot start in conference – You can't help but not be impressed. But I'm impressed with how she runs her program. I think there's a new energy for women's basketball. And this is coming from someone who is a Tony Kemper fan. I was always a huge fan of Tony Kemper. I supported him. I know you you don't try to. It's not my job to bury the coach or to support the coach. I mean, I can have opinions here. But if I'm trying to do the job the right way, I'm not after the coach. I'm not trying to get them. And I'm not going to talk them up when they shouldn't be talked up. I'm not going to inflate them, and I'm not going to deflate them. If that is what you're looking for, then I might not be your guy. But I can honestly say, Kim Caldwell, I'm impressed with what she's done so far, and you should be as well. She's really taken the Marshall women's basketball program and created a new sense of energy. They're fun to watch. You know, I got to see the last two games. Um, I don't usually have a chance to get over to the Henderson Center as much when there's crossovers, when Marshall men and women are playing. Had a great opportunity to see them the other day. Had a great opportunity on Saturday. They play a fun brand of basketball. I hope that the crowds continue. And, of course, to answer a text question earlier, it was, uh, I think, it was a game against Kentucky, and it was over 7,000. So that was the largest crowd to see a women's basketball game. You're not going to see that in the current configuration. So something in the 5,000 range will be the new high for Marshall in this seat configuration with the program. And, again, Hopefully, in the future, Marshall can do more with the facility. I know there was hopes years ago, different regime, 
that a new facility could eventually be funded and put together and built. We have a new basketball arena. I don't think that's going to be the case anytime soon. However, I think you can do a lot of things with the Henderson Center now. It's just going to take creative architectural designs, engineering, and money. And we're out of time. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate everyone who was with us today. We'll get this going next few days. We've got basketball on Wednesday. We don't have basketball on Saturday. So looking forward to it. Also, I know that there's going to be more announcements being made coming up this week regarding the new Tri-State baseball team. So I'm hoping that we'll have more details as we get closer to the start of baseball and softball and everything else that's happening with Marshall and, of course, the greater Huntington sports community. That's going to do it. Thanks for tuning in. I'll be back with you tomorrow here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. W227BS Huntington. This is 930 WRVC Huntington, celebrating 100 years of broadcasting.